inspiring all the people who were in line. Good. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. So I started up the webinar. We're just going to give people a few moments to get audio um, dialed okay. in so that they can hear us. So we'll get started probably in a, a few seconds. And hello to everyone joining us currently. Oh, good. So I see currently over 100. So we'll get started and I'll make sure I type this in the chat for people that are coming in a little bit later. Uh, but welcome to today's coffee break. Uh, before I hand it off to our moderator and presenter, I just want to cover a few quick uh, technical details about this platform. This is Zoom webinar, not Zoom meeting. So your cameras and microphones are disabled by default. So if you want to interact, uh, you're going to want to use the chat and the Q&A. Uh, you can use the Q&A for any question you have for Nicole. If, um, if you can ask those questions anonymously, you can view all existing questions and upvote them and add your own comments. And then you can use the chat for general discussion. Uh, we want to highly encourage you to use the chat today. Just make sure that you put all panelists and attendees in the drop down there so that everyone can see what you're writing. Otherwise, only we as the panelists can see it. So without further ado, I want to hand it off to Julia Fanaki. Good afternoon, everyone, and TGIF. We made it to Friday. I'm Julia Fanaki, Associate Director of ACRO, and I'd like to welcome you to the second webinar in our mental health series. Don't worry, if you missed the first one, the recording is available in the archived webinar section of the ACRO website. Dr. Perry Graves gave us some great tips for managing staff with compassion while still holding people accountable in this remote environment. We planned this series in response to the many conversations we have had since spring with our members who are managing the personal and professional fallout related to the pandemic. You've been asked to reinvent your jobs again and again, support your staff and your students and meet institutional goals with less resources. And we know it's taking a toll. Our surveys indicate an unprecedented stress level for our members. You're not alone. We wanted to give something back that might support you as you navigate this ongoing crisis. As always, we are hopeful that our technology will not fail us. This is a large Zoom, and we at ACRO, like many of you, are working remotely, so we remain at the mercies of our home Wi-Fi. You may use the chat freely while on the webinar. If you have a question for the presenter, please use the Q&A section to ask the question, and we will get to it at the end. You may also upvote questions that other people have asked. Mm -hmm. Today, we will talk about boundaries, COVID, and burnout with Nicole Weyer, founder of Root to Rise Coaching, where her clients are committed to playing, both with, playing big with an open heart, living their purpose, and striving to live whole, vibrant lives. Nicole knows your struggle. She spent the first 21 years of her career in schools. Her school, leadership experience created a firsthand perspective on the power of organizational cultures in fostering wellness or encouraging self-sacrifice, how burnout creeps into our lives and how we get stuck in a pattern of neglecting ourselves to serve others. She is committed to transforming schools by facilitating a conversation about the connection between employee morale, turnover and school culture by including burnout in this equation. Now I'll turn the mic over to Nicole. Nicole? Thank you so much, Julia and Michael, and good afternoon. Thank you so much to all of you who are tuning in live for this and to all of you who will, who will watch the recording. It's an honor to be here today and sharing this time and this space with you. Um, as Julia mentioned, I served schools for more than 20 years and I serve institutions across the country and understand the rigors of education both at the higher ed level and at the independent school level from the inside out, from the rhythms of the academic year and the politics of decisions to the reality of ever evolving responsibilities, the ebb and flow of faculty morale and the unparalleled pressure on all of us to balance the mission with the needs of the individual students and families. I have loved it and I have lived it. Now as a burnout prevention coach and trainer, I bring, I bring both a fresh and a candid perspective 
on empowering educators to serve themselves, their institutions, and their students in a new way. I walked out of the Dean's office a little over two years ago, committed to empowering educators and school leaders, flirting with burnout, learn ways to nourish themselves so they are leading within and beyond the classroom and across campus, guiding them to serve themselves and their institutions at the same time. We're gonna have an, an animated conversation today and I'm gonna share some information with you and also let you know how to learn more if it's of interest. Here's what I know to be true. These are extraordinary times that have brought challenges and opportunities and moments of both awe and confusion into our lives. 2020 has revealed itself to be a year each of us will surely never forget for a variety of reasons. 2020 is a year of choice. We can go it alone or we can do it together. What I know is true is this, together it doesn't seem so heavy. That's my goal for our time together today, to create community, to introduce ourselves to one another, to have a candid conversation, um, to reflect, and also to know very clearly that we are not alone wherever we are. And wherever we are, not only in our work life and in our professional life, but wherever we are around the world. So as we dive in and begin today, we're actually gonna begin with a moment of pause. And that moment of pause, um, next slide, there we go. We're gonna start with this moment of pause because in order to figure out how we want to end the year, we're actually gonna do a brief scan of what we've already accomplished. So far in this incredible year that is 2020. And I encourage you to just sit comfortably for a moment. And honestly, if you want to, just close your eyes and take a couple deep breaths. And remember back to when 2020 began. For many of us, it opened with goals and aspirations and the energy of a new year and a fresh start. We carry that momentum forward until an uninvited house guest showed up in February and in March and challenged us to navigate uncertainty and fear of the unknown and unanswered questions. COVID called each of us into a place of needing to confront something that we knew nothing about and that we had never experienced before. It was grow time <laughs> as we were pushed far, be out of our, far outside of our comfort zones. And in this moment, I invite you to consider how you found a way to get it done. Not only just to survive, but also to thrive, to put one foot in front of the other, to care for and show up for yourself and for others, knowing that it doesn't have to be pretty, it doesn't have to be manicured, and it doesn't even have to be how we all wanted it to happen. So consider this in terms of 2020. If you are a parent, your kids were suddenly at home all of the time. If you have a spouse or partner, they too may have been home all of the time. If your role required frequent travel, you were grounded and in some ways potentially felt like you were placed under house arrest. Your in-person interactions, the open houses, the receptions, the packed rooms became virtual overnight. If you were in your groove in the early weeks of 2020, you found that sweet spot at work. You were, you were forced to make a dramatic and drastic changes incredibly quickly. If you were someone who kept a healthy distance from technology, you were suddenly in an arranged marriage with it. Whatever your challenges were, you have navigated them because you are here today in almost the end of October. So what I invite you to do is to take a really big deep breath in and a long breath out. And as you do that, call to mind one thing that you've done very well in 2020 an example of your resilience in this unbelievable year. 
And as you come up with what that one thing is for you, I invite you to put it into the chat. Our chat today is a way for us to start to share ideas. It's a way for us to get to know each other. It's a way for us to think both within and way outside of the box. So I'm gonna encourage you to use it throughout our time together and to really start that now by sharing something you've done really well in 2020, by sharing an example of your resilience. Because when we pause for just a moment and we start to think about it, from that mindset shift, we can start to realize, holy cow, I've done it and I'm here. And that's the beauty of some of our time together today. Some of you have already said yoga practice and meditation and gardening, I love that. Family dinners and making dinner and meal preparation, fantastic. Um, more movement in our lives, running and getting outside for walks, love that. Um, learning to live day to day, absolutely. It's been this forced choice exercise and yet at the same time, there are an awful lot of blessings that may have come from this that we haven't given, our chance to, given ourselves a chance to really think about it. As this chat grows, I encourage you to kind of scroll up and down and look at all of the places where we have to be proud of ourselves. So as we do that, we're gonna dive right in <laughs> and we're gonna start by now really taking our own pulse. We can move to the next slide, there it is. Um, I invite each of you to look at this slide and I know it's packed with words and there's a lot of information here, but as you look through these different bullet points, how many might be true for you? So as you look at those, start to take a little mental tally or if you have pen and paper in front of you, make some notes and start your count. I think some of the ones on these on this screen that really jump out for me that have been true for me, um, making careless mistakes, forgetting my keys, um, mixing up dates, being double booked and missing a meeting, um, sometimes forgetting to pay a bill, um, forgetting to lock a door. Um, we talk about frequent colds and illness. That may show up in terms of, it's taking longer for me to recover from a cold or from an illness. Um, when we think about taking everything personally, oh my goodness, this is a big one. How frequently are you in dialogue with a colleague or one of your constituents and, and, that, and that conversation becomes deeply personal? Even though in your mind, you know it might not, it's really not about you, but it becomes very personal. When we talk about exhaustion despite regular sleep, how many of you might be logging those six, seven, eight hours, but you wake up in the morning still exhausted? So as we look at this list, um, I'm gonna put it, put, put it into some context for you. Um, this is from Thrive Global in November, 2018. And these are some of the main signs of burnout. I'm gonna let that sink in for just a moment. These are some of the main indicators of burnout when they are showing up frequently and regularly um, and at pretty unexplained numbers. So even though we just took a moment of pause to realize where we've been, we're going to take another moment of pause here. And as we do that, it's another opportunity for you to continue to fill the chat. Um, and as you did that mental tally of those different indicators, drop a number in, how many came up for you? How many of, the, of those signs are showing up regularly? Whether or not it is daily, whether or not it is weekly, whether or not it is just a couple times of the semester, Yep, yeah. five to six, four, nine, seven, two of them on a weekly basis, over half of them, five, sevens, seven to eight daily and weekly, absolutely. So as that chat continues to flow, my hope is that one of the things that we are all starting to realize 
is that we are not alone in this. <laughs> we are absolutely not alone in running and consistently running and even running ourselves ragged. So here's another piece. All of those indicators are incredibly powerful messages from your physical, mental, and emotional self. These are powerful messages that our body is sending to us. What may be true is that that communication kind of stops. That communication from your physical body up into your mind is really disconnected. So as you think about some of those key indicators, whether or not it's making careless mistakes, feeling as though you're failing, exhausted after sleep, what might be some of those messages that your body is trying to send to you? And as you reflect on that for a moment, translate some of those messages into our chat. What might those messages be? It's the why behind some of those signs. What might those be for you? And I think as we talk about the messages that come from our physical, mental, and emotional self, we would be remiss if we did not bring into the conversation the very real possibility um, and acknowledging the role that fear can play in our denial or our dismissal of these messages. It can be fear of failure. It can absolutely be fear of seeming less than or incapable. Um, looking around and surveying colleagues within and outside of your institution who appear to be able to do it all and feeling as though if I'm not able to perform at that level, then I am less than they are. Maybe some of it is fear that we should be able to handle it. I should be able to manage the schedule that I have, the expectations that are placed on me, um, the goals that are given to me, even though I might be able to generate and kind of co-create some of them. I love what Lena said. I have to hold it together for everyone. Absolutely. So true and so real. Here's what I will offer. Um, Ariana Huffington started a transformational conversation about sleep and burnout and losing ourselves in our work after she launched the Huffington Post. In her book on becoming fearless, she speaks eloquently to the role of fear in creating compulsions within us. Here are her words. Fear creates insecurity and insecurity creates another costly byproduct, workaholism when we are afraid of failing, when we feel we constantly have to prove ourselves, when we give priority to our jobs over everything and everyone else, this depletes our health and our spirit and keeps us in a state of constant tension. When workaholism sets in, we sacrifice the important on the altar of the urgent. Our lives lose their balance and we lose our center. The problem often stems from a massive and wrong-headed definition of the urgent. It's no longer a matter of worrying about how we deal with a blazing fire. Instead, it's the constant fear that a fire might start. So as we look to and start to notice and get really honest about how we feel and about the messages that we might be getting from our physical, mental, and emotional self that we may be denying, that we may be walking away from, it's not enough to simply acknowledge where we are, but it is enough to figure out what is one solution that can move me forward. And here's some solutions for you today and one of them is really powerful. And it's about creating a micro culture. And it's about that moment of asking yourself this, who brings out my best ideas, my intriguing solutions, who inspires me to operate from that sweet spot of incredible leadership and success 
and dependability and teamwork. Who are those people? As I say that, you're probably, you probably have faces or names coming to mind. Who are those people? And here's the opportunity. And here's another harder question at times. Are these the people that you're surrounding yourself with on a daily basis? Or is it possible that many of the people that you're surrounding yourself with are discontent, overwhelmed, um, unhappy in their professional life? Are they cranky? Are they crabby? And as we think about a microculture, here's what we know. When we surround ourselves with people who are calling us to that higher place, who are challenging us to problem solve rather than stay stuck, who are challenging us to read something new and be open to revising and evolving a process, working together towards an outcome, being in partnership with others. When we're surrounding ourselves with people who are in some ways like-minded, but also willing to have some of that dialogue, that back and forth, we end up reducing our burnout. We end up shifting our mindset. But here's also what some of the challenges. Um, what is necessary for me does not mean that it's comfortable, right? How many times have you done what was necessary and been wildly uncomfortable in the process? Probably many. By creating a microculture that supports you and supports who you are and what you want to accomplish, it's also important to recognize that that might ruffle some feathers of those around you. Yet that microculture gives you an opportunity to live in, to live in alignment with who you are and what you want and what you need. So another piece of, another piece of this is really about taking action. And what does that look like? Well, here's your first action step, everyone, today on this beautiful Friday. As I talked about and I asked, who are the people who bring out your best ideas, your most inspired solutions? Um, think about, is there someone within your institution that you admire for their energy, their attitude, their thoughtfulness, their ability to be nimble, um, their ability to be grounded? their ability to inspire those around you, their ability to persevere. If you have someone who falls into some of those boxes within your institution, invite them for a virtual cup of coffee and pick their brain. Use some of the resources that are around you and that are available to you instead of keeping them at bay. Inviting people into your microculture instead of potentially going it alone um, and feeling as though you're completely isolated. So here's the other piece um, about this as a, as a potential solution. And this is very real. Um, as you start to look around your institution and your communities and examine your constituencies, giving yourself time to explore the possibility that it might be time to find another institution to serve. Giving yourself space to say, does this continue to be a good fit for me? Does this continue to allow me to be in alignment with who I am and how I wanna feel and the life that I wanna be living and the contributions that I want to make? because it can be incredibly challenging and a fast track to complete and utter burnout if we, can't, if we really struggle to find those resources and examples within our institutions. Um, we need some of those examples and people who are willing to dialogue about how they thread that needle of, of their jobs. Um, and, for some, and at some points, it can become a question of self-preservation. Jim Rohn has this beautiful quote that really speaks to this idea of who are we surrounding ourselves with? And I wanna share it with you. He says this, you must ask, you must constantly ask yourself these questions. Who am I around? What are they doing to me? What have they got me reading? What have they got me saying? 
Where do they have me going? What do they have me thinking? And most importantly, what do they have me becoming? Then ask yourself the big question, is this okay? Your life does not get better by chance, it gets better by change. Even though sometimes change can pluck that string and that, fe and that string of fear within us. So here's an opportunity for, for all of us to participate and to kind of jump into the chat for a moment. Think of a person in your institution that you would like to invite into your microculture. And you can either drop their name in, you can drop their role in. Um, if you have that person, you can even just say, I've got a person within my institution. I've got one. Um, and for some of you, it might be finding a person outside of your institution that you want to invite in. And if you have that person, if, if, if that name and, and their face comes to mind, drop their name in, say, yes, I've got an, I've got an inside and an outside of my, of my organization person that I'm thinking about. Because when we pause for a moment, it gives us an opportunity to really examine full, fully the different opportunities and the resources that are around us. So as you come up with someone, give it a yes in the chat. If you've got a few that you wanna bring in, um, put down a number, put down a yes, put down a, mm, I'm thinking about it. And as we do that, um, and as you start to add in that, those pieces and those numbers, yep, lots of yeses coming in. And I love that wanting to look for someone outside as well. Absolutely, yep. We, we think better and we perform better, the broader and the more inclusive and diverse our, our circle is. Yep. Jillian, you make a really good point that it's hard to say, that it feels like everyone is burned out and negative. Yep. And that is, that is one of our challenges in 2020, right? I appreciate your honesty so much. Um, so we've touched briefly on the burnout piece. We're going to jump into this kind of behemoth that is 2020, that is COVID. <laughs> yep. So how many of you like to be in control? Thumbs up in the chat or a yes. How many of you like to be in control? Uh, yep. Oh, we have yeses even in capitals. Yep. This is us, right? Did COVID throw you for a loop? Yes or no, COVID threw me for a loop. COVID, I think, threw everyone into a tailspin. Absolutely. Were you anticipating that 2020 was gonna throw your life into a prolonged state of uncertainty, chaos, and sheltering and working from home? Probably not. As I said at the top, in my mind, COVID has become this uninvited house guest, right? who plucked us from the driver's seat for those of us who like to be in control, who like to make decisions um, and who are independent and feel as though we have the agency to do that. COVID is kind of this thing that plucked all of us out of the driver's seat where we're comfortable and kind of threw us in the trunk, right? Or it took us as adults and like put us in the infant seat in the very far back of our car. And that was jarring and that was shocking. Um, and it was a moment for us to all simply pause. And we've done that. And the pause is continuing. And so part of it is really just acknowledging that so much of this was really unexpected and that that's okay. And also acknowledging that it's not something that any of us have ever experienced before. So that means we are going to stumble. We are going to bump into one another. We are going to have fantastic plans and have them fall very flat. We are going to, we are going to have to figure out how to completely reframe and evolve many of the functions in our personal and professional lives. So when we start at that place that says, we are all having an experience in COVID and it's different and it's okay that it's not perfect. 
Is it possible that you feel some of the weightlifting? Is it possible that you can give yourself permission to be human? Ariana Huffington says this and I love it. She says, we all have within us the ability to move from struggle to grace. And that is, um, that's part of us as humans. Um, and part of it is also sometimes we can give that permission to others more freely than we can give it to ourselves. So as we think about COVID, there are a couple of different ways that we can respond to uncertainty and that we can respond to this pretty unbelievable year that we are in because we know that it is nothing that we would have written into a script. So a common response when we're dealing with uncertainty is that comparison game, right? Oof, that comparison game of they look like they've got it all together. This colleague is making this look really super flawless and really easy. <laughs> we start to figure out and measure ourselves against how we think we're supposed to be managing and functioning. When truth be told, we're doing the very best that we can. But how often do we give ourselves a moment to just say, I'm showing up and I'm here and I'm giving it my best, right? Brene Brown speaks eloquently about authenticity and she says this, authenticity is the daily practice of letting go who we think we are supposed to be and embracing who we are. So again, it comes back to giving ourselves permission to press pause on that comparison game. This director has already met their goals, why haven't I? This person has people attending their virtual events, mine aren't as good. Um, this institution has already met their goals, how have we failed? Why are we struggling? Let's use ourselves as our own measuring stick and see if our sleep improves, <laughs> if our digestion settles down, if our mood improves <laughs> um, and to see how we are carrying ourselves and going about the business of living our lives shifts when we start to measure ourselves against ourselves. So here's another common response to uncertainty and it's that it can be that crazy pendulum swing that, that shows up. Here's a question. Um, how many of you increased your work hours after your shelter in place began? Give me a yes in the chat, right? Yep. How many of you went from still more than a 40 hour week to way off the charts, right? That pendulum swing can be when we, when things are unknown, when things are uncertain, when things are ambigu ambiguous, what, what do we try to do? Work all the time. We try to figure out what we can control and we can, we can throw ourselves into it even more. So here's a question for those of you who said, yep, increase the hours big time. Um, was it based on the needs of your organization or a compulsion to work more maybe in your mind to help save your institution, retain, retain um, students, work on building your constituents, or navigating the uncertainty. So was it, was it that, I love that Melanie says, all of that, yes. Were we in this pendulum swing, I'm, I'm already performing here and I'm already putting in these hours and now it's more. And what was that about? Here's what I will also offer when our contributions and when we go into that pendulum swing of working all the time and even what Ariana Huffington talked about in terms of workaholism, let's start thinking about what was the quality, what has the quality of your presence been over the past six months when, you're, when your hours invested has increased exponentially? The quality of your presence. And again, Huffington says this, we think mistakenly, that success is the result of the amount of time we put in at work instead of the quality of the time that we put in. 45, 50 hours of focused, 
rested, nourished you will have a bigger impact than 70, 80 hours of a you that is exhausted, depleted, <laughs> um, not sleeping well, um, short on patience, having digestive upset, stress and overwhelm are off the charts. So it's that way to say, what is the quality of my presence, right? What are some of the things that I can start to think about in terms of how do I, how do I start to bring my best? Because that means that I can show up more fully for everyone else that's around me. I love what Michael says. Problem is not the surge during the uncertainty, but when it calmed down, yes. Yep. And then the decisions were made about fall. So we hit the surge. You, many of you got through it and did it beautifully, um, although it may not have been how you would have expected. And yet at the same time, you got through it. And then there was, then there was that second wave of hit of here's what we're going to do with fall. Most of our institutions have already decided what, are they, what they're doing with winter term and even for the rest of the academic year. And then there's kind of another, there's another variable thrown right into your path. So here's an important mindset piece. Um, how we talk about COVID impacts our experience, impacts our mindset, impacts our energy. Um, you've heard me refer to COVID as the uninvited house guest. <laughs> um, if you listen to a lot of news and a lot of news outlets over the past eight to 10 months, um, it certainly is a pandemic. But when we look at some of our language and whether or not it's all the sky is falling, negative dreading language, it impacts our mindset. Because where our mind goes, our energy flows. So if our language is all around the sky is falling, even though most sometimes it actually is, um, and if our language is very heavy and very weighted, that's where our energy travels next. Oh, I love what Elizabeth says, an uninvited work colleague. Beautiful, yes. Um, so we've talked a little bit about how we want to respond to uncertainty, and now we're going to shift into what might be some of the opportunities and blessings from COVID. And again, some of you might be, <clears throat> might be listening to this and thinking, I'm not so sure there's a blessing here. And in fact, there really is. Um, if we can, there we go. Um, wisdom gained and, and lessons learned. Um, Sarah Lewis wrote, an, wrote a pretty impactful book in my mind. It's called The Rise, Creativity, the Gift of Failure and the Search for Mastery. And in it, she talks about what many psychologists call the, um, the Einstein effect. And it is this, the cost of success is that it can block our ability to see when what has worked well in the past might not any longer and how our own bias can limit us as leaders because we are unable to see another way of doing things. So for some of us, we were really comfortable in our roles pre-COVID, very comfortable with the systems and the processes and our team. Then everything shifted. And now we are eight months in and it's, it's a moment for us to stop and consider for a moment what were some of the successful adjustments that we made, right? What are some of those things? What were ways that we pivoted, which is obviously the newest hot word anywhere. What are some of the successful adjustments that you made within your role, within your team as a leader, right? Put those in the chat. What were, the, what were some of the adjustments that you made that have served you well? And here's another piece of it. What may not have worked that you can absolutely leave behind? No one says everything and every process that we have has to serve us at all times. There was a lot of trial and error during COVID and there's gonna be more going forward into the rest of the year. Giving ourselves permission to say, we tried that, ooh, that didn't work so well, let's leave it behind us and let's figure out what we, if there's something else that we wanna introduce now. As you consider the last eight months, what were some of maybe those bumpy places and bumpy changes that you introduced that have some pieces of it 
that you know and that your team know can be a benefit, but it's a little bit rough and it needs some polish. Because there's been so much learning that has happened in all of our lives, personally and professionally. And when we give ourselves a moment to stop and think, I tried this in my mind. I thought it was really going to be <laughs> really going to be successful. Wow, it's been really bumpy. But the essence of that idea, of that process, of that new strategy for our office, there's something there. How do we polish it? If you have those ideas, put those into the chat. Because again, this is time for all of you to start sharing information and picking the brains and picking up some other ideas. So here's another one. Um, when we talk about some of the lessons, it's, it, it goes beyond the processes in our offices um, and how we are in our kind of daily to-do lists. So my question for you that I would love to see you put in, into our chat today is this. Share something that you've learned about yourself as a leader, as a team member, or as a colleague that you want to, that lesson that you want to carry forward um, for the rest of this year and into 2021. We don't often give ourselves a moment to acknowledge our growth and to acknowledge where we started from and where we are today. We don't often give ourselves an opportunity to say, what am I learning? This is your opportunity today. What are the, what are lesson you have learned about yourself? Somebody likes working from their backyard. Yep. Don't mind Matt. Don't multitask very well. Key learning there. Yep. I'm at my best in a crisis. Mm -hmm. Learning how to be flexible, learning how to adapt to major changes. Love it. Yep. Important learning the importance of making and taking time to show appreciation. Love it. Mm -hmm. That I can do way more than I thought I could. Thank you, Charnette, for that. I think in many ways, we've learned how strong and resilient we really are, especially in the face of things that feel like they have brought us to our knees. Well done. Keep that chat going. So we're going to step into the last component of today. We've talked about burnout. We've touched a little bit on COVID. We're jumping into my favorite topic, and that is boundaries. Um, and some of you are probably thinking, how can this be her favorite topic? I love to talk about boundaries because for me, our boundaries are really such a powerful empowerment tool. Here's what I mean. Our boundaries are essential in many ways, mostly because of this. They serve as an indicator of how we respect and honor ourselves and how we can in fact empower everyone else in our life. Because when our boundaries are in place, we can actually call another person to a higher version of themselves. Because we don't allow others to play small. We do not allow others to make excuses and not take responsibility for themselves. So here's the interesting piece about a lot of our boundaries, everybody our boundaries are formed and we get messages about that before we know what they are. Like most things, when we are very, very young, we start to take in information and messages and we observe interactions and we, have, and we observe all the different feelings and the energy that's all around us. So here's my question. Um, what did you see at home, at school, maybe in your neighborhood or in your community or early in your career, what kind of messaging did you have around boundaries? These early messages imprint and create a powerful foundation for all of us. Um, if we were, if we felt that we were seen and heard, if we felt invisible, if our creativity was nurtured or was it stifled? Were we encouraged to express our opinion? Were you able to articulate your needs and have them met? Did you have examples around you of people who were caring for themselves? Were you taught to serve others before caring for yourself? Were you surrounded by examples of adults saying yes and saying no without conflict? 
are some of those initial images and impressions and messages about boundaries um, that they have to be fortified and they can never change? Or can it be that they are in fact malleable? Thank you for Bianca. Thank you to Bianca for her, for what you put in here. Do not, do not do something against your will, protect your space, love it. Mm -hmm. So when we start to think about our early family messages, that impacts where our boundaries are. Um, when we think about those early messages about boundaries in our professional life, um, what, were those, what were those for us? Were they examples of um, people that we admired that felt like they had some modicum of work-life balance? Who knows? Were they boundaries? Were those messages that you serve your institution and your organization at all costs? So here's the important piece. And this is one of those moments to get really honest with ourselves. Um, are your boundaries crossed frequently? At different times in my life, mine absolutely were. Um, absolutely. And it took me a long time to realize that people crossing my boundaries wasn't about them. It was about me. And it was about me giving people permission to do that. At different times, I felt as though um, I was kind of the go-to person in, in an institution that I served. And when other people, when we would have, you know, next steps or things to do in between meetings, I would always, I would always get it done. <laughs> I found a time to do it. I could manage my time. I got stuff done. I put in the extra time, right? And then other colleagues maybe hadn't done that and they would come to me and I can't tell you how many times I said, sure, I can get that done for you. Yes, I'm happy to help. Yep, how many other people have done that, have been that go-to person to help, to help someone out when they needed it? And I'm not talking about the, those, those moments where there truly is an emergency where something has happened where someone truly can't get it done. I'm talking about that pattern of people coming to you knowing that you're gonna say yes, <laughs> regardless of what's happening. Here's what it took me a long time to realize. When I consistently picked up after other people or stepped in when someone dropped the ball, that in some ways I'm sending a message to them that I don't think that they can do it. That when I consistently pick up after others, when I am consistently, again, stepping in when things haven't been done, when you're sitting in a meeting and there's and, and someone says, who can take this on? And you know your plate is full and you say yes anyway, who has done that, right? Do you really have the time? No, but you're that person. You are that yes person. That is about us and not necessarily about our institution. That is about sitting and saying, I need to feel needed. I need to feel wanted. I need to feel important. I need to feel seen or heard or valued. And that has nothing to do with our institutions. So here's the other question about boundaries. And we have just absolutely taken a deep dive into an incredibly huge topic. Um, but one of the reasons why I love it is that it gives us an opportunity to figure out what work we need and want to do. So here's, my, here's one of my final questions. Is there a part of you that believes that success requires running yourself ragged? That in order to be good at your job or to be successful, it requires you to put in an unbelievable amount of time um, that somehow success, running myself ragged, are absolutely married to each other. 
And if that's true for you, I invite you to consider this, that that might not really be about success, but it might actually about our, be about our relationship with money. What were the money messages when you were younger? Um, what were the messages that you got in your family and in your community very early on about money? Um, I'll share a couple of mine. Oh, I love Teresa. Yes, your boss does. So it filters down to the office. Yes. When our leaders are wedded to running themselves ragged, they set the tone and the culture and it is a challenge to find our own path there. Absolutely. So um, money messages that I heard when I was growing up. Hard work pays off. Nothing. Oh, yes. Money doesn't grow on trees. Yep. Um, everybody must pay their dues. That was a big one. Um, I had examples around me that if you're not grinding, that you're not successful. Um, also had powerful messages about self-sacrifice, that the more that we sacrificed ourselves, the more successful we were going to be. So um, I also had examples around me, which were exactly what you'll, um, what Teresa says in terms of leadership examples. They were, they were logging really long hours. And so if that's, if that's a trajectory that I want to be on in my professional life, then I need to do that. Who has followed that one? Oh my goodness. Yep. If I want that, if I want that position, then there is one path to it. And it's exactly, um, it's exactly what has gone before me. Absolutely. So here's the question. Does that money story serve you today? Does that messaging about hard work pays off, money doesn't grow on trees? Um, oh, I love what Rebecca says about being generational. I do think a lot of it is generational. Um, if your money story doesn't serve you today, here's the important piece of it. And the beauty of it is that we can rewrite it. At any time that we want to, we can rewrite that story. So before we go into questions, um, I wanna wrap up and, and say certainly to all of you that this was really an opportunity to ask what if, to wonder, to get a little bit curious, um, to share a lot about where we are and what's real for us right now. Some of this may have described you perfectly, some of it may not. And that's the beauty of where we are today. We can take what's helpful and we can decide if it fits and then we can walk away and leave the rest of it here. If it does fit, if it does hit home for you, then we enter into this beautiful place of choice. Do I wanna keep things the way that they are? Do I wanna to continue to feel how I feel now? <laughs> um, experience my days as they are now or potentially do I wanna shift things around a little bit? Might I want to dig in to my mindset to figure out where I am stuck and comfortably uncomfortable that's keeping me in that place. Do I wanna revisit my boundaries? Do they need a 2.0 upgrade? You do software updates on your laptops and on your phones, you can do an update on your boundaries as well. We have the opportunity to, to make a choice, to show up for ourselves in a powerful way that honors who we are and what we need. This is your time. You have the opportunity to craft the rest of 2020 exactly how you want it to be. And I'm gonna drop a bit.ly link in the chat. Um, if this conversation has hit home for you, if this has resonated in any way, if it sounds like this is a conversation that you want to have um, with me, there's an opportunity to join, um, join my Root to Rise community get my newsletter, even have a one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me, or have a conversation about how this conversation may serve your institution. So I'm going to drop in this link, and then I'm going to turn it over to Julia and hopefully have a chance to answer some questions. Um, and you can share any insights or appreciations that you have from our time together. Thank you so much. Wow, that was fantastic. I, I'm so excited we did this on a Friday afternoon and I can take all this into the weekend and savor it um, and think about it and kind of ruminate over this. 
Um, we do have one question. Perfect. And I think it's a great question um, because I know I've been there. And it is, since the start of this crisis, my biggest challenge has been managing my teen's screen time. Ugh. I can limit all right, but then I'm too depleted to propose, organize, participate in any non-screen related activity that requires my active mindful presence. Mm. So we resort back to the screen, flick on Netflix, and I tell myself it's not so bad because at least we're all watching it together. Yeah. But for hours and hours on end, I feel like the failure of a single mother. I can't mm. ask them to occupy themselves by doing something creative or reading or exercise when I can't do it myself. Yeah. First of all, thank you for being incredibly honest. Um, my first response is you're doing the very best that you can. And you are showing up for multiple people in your life on a daily basis. My next response is really that this, this may be a great opportunity to let yourself off the hook and not have perfection and kind of that ideal goal be what you're striving for. One idea and one thing to, to consider is, is there an opportunity to engage, your, to engage your family and engage your children in that conversation about on a weekly basis? Maybe there's one, one night over dinner and part of the agenda is, what are some things that we wanna to do together this week? Non-tech time, like taking, taking a tech holiday. What are some things that we wanna to do together? Bring them into the problem solving because it might just be grab our, bikes and, grab our bikes and head to the park. It could be, let's go for a walk. It could be, let's play a board game. Um, but knowing that you don't have to have all the answers, um, bring your children into it. Maybe they wanna color, maybe they wanna draw. Maybe they wanna turn your house into an obstacle course <laughs> and do some different activities in that way. Um, there's def there are definitely opportunities to, um, to really step back and bring them into this process. Um, another opportunity might be, do you have neighbors or family members um, that have kids that are the same age and you're able to do some physically distant, COVID safe interactions um, that might give you a time to refuel a little bit more um, and maybe give, give your children some extra time to be hanging out with other people. Um, I can, the last thing that I'll say is um, acknowledging your courage to, to share and to ask this question and the fact that you're thinking about it um, you are 100% not failing. You are 100% serving and showing up and aware of just the dynamic challenges that we're facing. Um, happy to talk with you about this more if that's helpful. Um, and I would love the opportunity to do that. Best way to do that is to follow that bit.ly um, and just share some information with you. I'm happy to jump on a Zoom and continue the dialogue. There are some more wonderful more questions, but I think we're only going to have time to take one more. Okay. Um, but I think this one's important. How can you tell the difference between burnout and depression? Having lost my mom in January and now dealing with this pandemic. That is another beautiful question. And thank you. Um, thank you to, to the person who posed that question. Um, there are some there are some pretty standard um, kind of implications and signs and symptoms of depression. Um, some of them cross over a little bit with burnout. I think um, if this is already something that's on your radar, you're already keenly aware that, that something's not feeling right. I would really recommend um, having a conversation with your doctor. Um, depression tends to be feeling specific things over a prolonged period of time. And I know this year, because we're now eight months into this and it's not over yet, it can be really hard to be discerning. Um, that's where getting a hold of your physician is helpful. Um, if you're someone who is already engaged and working um, with counseling, that's a great conversation to have um, because there definitely is some crossover. Um, I think if, if you're finding more, more prolonged symptoms um, of some of those crossovers, like a really flat affect, 
um, wanting to sleep all the time and some of the others, then that would, that's a great time to really outreach to some of your people that are on your team. Wonderful, thank you. We're gonna leave it there. Uh, we will share the rest of the questions with Nicole um, and uh, she may email you or she's got the link. Did you put the link in the chat, Nicole? I did, let me, let me put it again. Okay. Let me drop thank it down you. here again. Ooh, make sure it's there. There you go. I just Wonderful. put it. Up. I see it. I see um, it. Yep. There's, okay. a, there's the link to find me. Um, I think Julia and um, I've created a handout for all of you that's got a whole bunch of different resources, some really quick articles to read on a bunch of these different types of topics. And that's going to be emailed to all of right. you um, along with a recording. So None of it's graded, none of it's required, but it is an opportunity to just kind of plug in and, and do a little bit more reading and get some tips that can really support you in the important and, and tremendous work that you're all doing right now. And having peeked at that, it is some wonderful resources that she is sharing with us. So just a few final comments. Um, we missed seeing our members at the annual meeting this past spring. So while our in-person meetings have been suspended in the near term, we know that you and your staff continue to have professional development needs. The months ahead are packed with mostly free programming that will help you to do your jobs now and hopefully stay sane doing them. We have launched a new communication called This Month at ACRO to share with you all that we have planned. In addition to the mental health series, and there are two more, we have tons of virtual content across all of our professional areas and interests. There are two new research reports available, one on stranded credits and the other on student records for closed schools. We've also just released our holistic admissions publication available in the bookstore today. Next week, we hope that you will join us for ACRO's first fully virtual SEM conference. We have frozen the early bird pricing and the agenda is packed with not only sessions and plenary panels, but also in-depth workshops embedded in and included for free with a registration price. SEM is not just a function of admissions, it's a way of organizing and aligning staff and resources for both institutional and student success. So this is a tremendous opportunity to give your academic records and enrollment service teams the, exposure, the experience and exposure of SEM at an incredibly affordable rate. We hope to see you there. Again, profound thank you to Nicole for this great session today. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you again online soon. Bye-bye, TGIF. Have a great weekend. Take care, everybody.